2023 was the year Novak Djokovic turned 36. It also marked the year he declared game, set, match on the men's tennis debate over the GOAT, the greatest of all time. Djokovic has 24 major singles titles now, two more than his longtime rival Rafael Nadal, four more than Roger Federer. Next month, Djokovic heads to the Australian Open, an event he's already won 10 times. Last month, he invited us to his hometown and took us inside the catacombs of his mind, sharing insight on how to ascend to the top level of sports and stay there. The story will continue in a moment. It was a late morning workout in Belgrade, Serbia. And Novak Djokovic let us in on a key to his staggering success. Forget speed or strength. Flexibility enables him to perform feats like this. It's also enabled him to contort and twist the laws of time. You are beating players right now, good players, who are closer in age to your kids than they are to you. How much satisfaction does that give you? <laughs> I like that. I don't know if that sounds good, uh, to be honest. But uh, yeah, I think the young guys who are very hungry uh, and very inspired to play their best tennis against me is an additional motivation. I think they kind of awaken the beast in me. Djokovic is no longer chasing records. He's creating them. His stubborn habit of winning major titles started in 2008. And it's gone on and on. Half of his 24 coming after he turned 30, most recently last September's U.S. Open. He says that he may not be as fast as he once was, but he's wiser and more accurate. Give us a sense of the size of the target you're aiming for. <laughs> Like this, <laughs> a little coin. At times, yes. At times, yes. At You're times, being serious. Hey, I'm serious. You know, at times I'm aiming, you know, for this size. Sometimes I'm aiming for this size. It depends on a, in a moment of the match, who am I playing against, um, what the tactic is. Another part of his tactics, looking for any hint of weakness across the net. Even though there's no physical contact in tennis, there's still a lot of eye contact when we are changing ends, when we're sitting on the bench, and then the big screen shows him how he drinks his water, and then I'm looking at him. How is he drinking water? Is he sweating more than usual? Is he breathing? Oh, you're taking all you this know, in during a match? Is he, exactly. Is he breathing deeply or not deeply? And then I look how he's communicating with his team. You know, you have all these different elements that are in play that uh, really uh, affect the performance in the game itself. Can I tell you what one of the hardest things about covering you is? People understand big muscles and speed and grace. Mental strength, mm. which is what I think is your great gift, is much harder to articulate. Can you I would help have us to explain? correct you. I have to yeah. correct right, you. It's correct not a you. gift. It's something that comes with work. You train for the mental side the way you would your serve or your, Absolutely. your forehand. How? Absolutely. Well, there are different techniques. Conscious breathing is a big part especially in the moments when you're under tension. I think a lot of people think, oh, in the moment, Novak's so locked in. You're saying this is all part of a process. Oh, I mean, I might appear maybe locked in, but, you know, trust me, there's a storm inside. And, you know, the biggest always battle is within, right? Take us in there. Yeah, right? I mean, you know, you have your doubts and fears. I feel it every single match. I don't like this kind of a mindset that I see a lot in sports, like, just think positive thoughts, be optimistic. There is no room for failure. There is no room for, you know, uh, doubts and stuff like this. It's, it's impossible you to don't do buy that. that. You are a human being. The difference, I guess, between the guys who are able to be biggest champions and the ones that are struggling to get to the highest level is the ability to not stay in those emotions for too long. So for me, it's really relatively short. So as soon as I experience it, I acknowledge it. I maybe, you know, burst, I scream on the court, whatever happens. But then I'm able to bounce back and reset. Some days you win and you're just, you're the better player. You're more precise, yeah. you're more powerful. Other times you are just better mentally. That happened in 2000 and 
19 when I played finals of Wimbledon, that, that marathon match, epic match with Roger. He had two match points on his serve. I remember that very well. <laughs> Fifth and decisive set, Wimbledon center court, historically pivotal match, crowd squarely with Roger Federer, who stood one point from victory. Djokovic stayed alive with cold-blooded shots like this. I beat him 13-12 in the fifth set. The sets that I won were all won in tiebreaks, 7-6, 7-6, 13-12. And overall, if you see stats, he was far better player in every aspect. But I won the match. And so that actually tells you that you can still win if you pick and choose in which moments of the match you're peaking and you're playing your best when it matters. At the outset of his career, Djokovic couldn't break through against Federer and Nadal. He was the third wheel. And, he now admits, he felt intimidated by them before big matches. I'm playing Nadal in Roland Garros and I have his locker next to my locker. Right, so we are so close. And we're trying to give each other space, but then locker room is also not that big. And the way you jump around like Nadal does, before we go out on the court in the locker room, he's doing sprints next to you. I can even hear the music he's listening to, you know, in his headphones. So, you know, it's pissing me off. So way before, way before. you hit the first ball, this Absolutely. competition started. Absolutely. Early in my career, I didn't realize how all that's part of the scenario, right? So I was getting intimidated by that. But it's also motivating me to do stuff myself and to show that I'm ready. You know, I'm ready for a battle, for a war. If Djokovic has now surpassed his rivals on scoreboards and in record books, he is aware that he's never quite matched their soaring popularity. The amount of pressure and stress is so much higher if you have crowd against you. Home so, game versus road game. Absolutely. Um, but <laughs> for most of my career, it was mostly hostile environments for me. I kind of learned how to thrive in that environment. And people think that it's actually better if, if they don't like me so that it kind of gets the best out of me in terms of tennis. It did happen, but at the same time, I actually enjoy more <laughs> being in an environment where, you know, I have nice, nice support. Djokovic is open about this, too. He sometimes struggles with, how to put it, impulse control. Your tennis is so precise and crisp. How do you handle it when you make these sort of errors and lapses, when you break a racket or when your emotions get the better of you? Well, look, you know, I, I have broken rackets in my life, you know, no doubt about it, and I'm not proud of, about that. And I'm ashamed of myself when I do that, no doubt. But at the same time, you know, I accept myself as a flawed human being. Djokovic found controversy of a larger scale in early 2022. Unvaccinated, he got an exemption to play the Australian Open at a time when the country was coming out of a long COVID lockdown. But after public outcry, Djokovic was deported, making for a global news event. How much of a toll did that whole controversy take on you? It did. I was basically declared as a villain of the world, you know, and... You sense that? Of course, and I had basically, yeah, most of the world against me. I had that kind of experience on the tennis court with, with crowds that were not maybe cheering me on, but I never had this particular experience before in my life. Did you misread the Australian public? and what the reaction would be. I mean, which way did I misread them? I mean, they don't like exceptionalism. This was a culture that felt very strongly well, about vaccinations. Well, but the point is that it was not up to me to read an, anybody. I got the exemption, I got the permission to come into the country. And, and so, of course, it escalated to the highest of the highest levels globally. Correct me if I'm wrong, you were not against vaccination, you just did not want it for yourself. Exactly. People tried to, you know, declare me as an anti-vax. I'm not anti-vax. No, I'm pro-vax. Pro I'm, I'm, I'm pro-freedom to choose. There are so many dimensions to Djokovic. He may polarize, but he is remarkably accessible. He may be tennis's apex predator, but is exceedingly popular among his prey, that is, with other players. He's won more money than any tennis player in history yet co-founded a players association designed largely to ease the financial burden of pro tennis's rank and file. You understand how extraordinary this is. That we talk about in tennis, you say, eat what you kill. 
Well, you're helping the others eat, who are the same folks that want to take food off your table. Well, because I have plenty. You know, I have much more than what I need. But women and men who are around 200 and lower ranked in the world, they are struggling a lot. They can't afford a coach. They can't afford the travels. They skip tournaments. Many of them leave tennis who are super talented and maybe capable of, of reaching great heights and successes, but they just can't make it. Coming from a small country and meager means himself, Djokovic knows this better than anyone. When he returned to Serbia in September after winning the U.S. Open, 20,000 fans greeted him. He was overcome by it all. During our visit to Belgrade last month, we noticed the prominence of the conquering hero and the speculation about where his popularity might take him next. Pretty obvious you're going to be the leader of this country one day. What kind of a leader are you going to be? <laughs> How do you know? <laughs> you're making some am... kind of claims here that I, I'm not even aware of. I'm seeing your popularity here. You will have an easier time at the ballot box here than you will winning in Australia. And you've done that 10 times. Uh, I love how you are phrasing and formulating this question the way you do it. It's so, you know, uh, well, I do not have any political inspirations at the moment. I don't feel uh, that this is um, a world or an environment where I would thrive. But I do think that my popularity in the country and in the region can be used for some other things where I can help contribute to life and society. Specifically, he and his wife Yelena have a foundation, and this goes way beyond your average athlete philanthropy, that's built or renovated more than 50 Serbian preschools and counting. As for their own children, Stefan, age nine, and Tara, age six, they play a role in their father's tennis longevity. Is the fact that your kids are old enough not just to watch you play, but to really appreciate what dad's doing out there, is that a reason to keep playing? Yes, it is. Actually, years ago, I had a dream that my daughter and my son will be able to watch me win Wimbledon Trophy. So that happened several times. I was very fortunate to experience that. Maybe the ultimate career extender? A new rival to continue stoking his fire. Spain's Carlos Alcaraz, age 20 the only player to beat Djokovic at a major this year. He's as a complete of a player as I have seen in ages. I'm gonna bounce a theory off you. It was a disappointing day for you, but in a way, this was energizing that you had this young challenger. Yes, absolutely, it was. Uh, and, and you're right, because it, that pissed me off so much that I needed to win everything on American soil, which I did. <laughs> It's a great opportunity for me to reinvent myself and really push harder than I ever did. I'm far more primitive. Covering Djokovic's rise to the top. I really belong here. I belong at the top of men's tennis. At 60minutesovertime.com.